Hello and welcome to the British Sitcom History Podcast. It's Series 2, Gareth. Hello! Yes! What is it? (laughs) My name is Alan, Uh, that's Gareth there, doing his impatient hotelier routine. And uh, yes, we are back for Series 2. All the best programmes have two series, Mm -hmm. and they're never any further. Let's not not get carried away. (laughs) Uh, Yes, today, to open up Series 2, we are doing Faulty Towers, uh, an absolute classic Mm -hmm. of British comedy, and one fondly remembered still today. And let's just... I don't know for for whatever reason it really struck me the, with this one, but Faulty Towers came out in 1975. That's mm-hmm. 46 years ago. Don't tell me that. I was born in 1975. I know how bloody long ago it was. <laughs> but it, for some reason, maybe it's because you were born then, it struck me just how long ago that was. <laughs> We're as close to that Faulty Towers opening now as Faulty Towers is to Al Capone getting imprisoned for tax evasion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I saw Faulty Towers, I presume, when it was repeated in the early 80s. And so it yeah. already felt a bit old to me. Yeah. It was a repeat of something from the 70s. So whilst I appreciate what you're saying, I don't feel... This doesn't make me feel old in quite the same way as something like Bread or Dear John from the (laughs) 80s make me feel old. In terms of dating it, it just feels like something that happened before I was born in much the same way as Steptoe did. Yeah. Well, I think the reason it sort of jumped out at me for this one particular is because it doesn't feel that old. Mm. And so it kind of is shocking when you think, oh, wow, that's a long time ago. There is a, a, a sort of timeless nature about it. These hotels, they kind they basically still exist, not quite in the same way, but there's nothing here that particularly dates it, other than perhaps some old-fashioned sort of ideas, yeah, uh, like attitudes to sex and stuff like that. Well, yeah, and well, there's obviously some racial epithets that are used in some of these episodes, mm. which have been controversial recently, that have been censored on various TV streaming sites. But that's that's fair enough. You talked about how these hotels still exist. I have got a memory of staying in Skegness as a kid. I think maybe with yeah. my auntie, where we were staying at a bed and breakfast, nothing quite so grand as Faulty Towers. But you weren't allowed in the place during the day. You had to, you sort of had your breakfast, it was bed and breakfast, and then you had to get out, in my memory, for the rest of the day. I'm not sure if that's true or not. But, you know, they, they closed the place down so they could, I don't know, do whatever the hell they wanted. So these, shall we call them, establishments of hospitality that weren't very hospitable <laughs> were, were fairly common, I think, in British seaside resorts. Well, I think it was largely the inspiration. I think I have heard John Cleese use the phrase, um, hotels run for the convenience of the staff, mm. when he's referring to things like the meal time times and all that. You, oh, you want to have a meal after nine o'clock? That's a completely crazy idea. That's, yeah. that's ridiculous. So I think that is the inspiration behind the whole thing. That small-minded business owner yeah. <laughs> sort of thing. But there is actually a very specific uh, inspiration point for Faulty Towers. Yeah, I think I might have heard this story, but, but go on, you tell it. It's quite a famous story, yeah. So in the in the 60s, it was about 67, I guess, they were filming some Monty Python scenes down in talkie somewhere like that and they stayed at a hotel called the Glen Eagles and the guy who ran it was a guy called Donald Sinclair and his wife Beatrice and they were just the husband particularly was just incredibly rude Mm. and sort of henpecked and the he was small the wife was big and 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 that was that's classic comedy right there just very rude and there's all sorts of anecdotes that have come out of it now obviously with him uh, being the the inspiration for Basil Fawlty and so the Python team they stayed there one night and then left because it was just horrible and they Mm. just went somewhere else except for John Cleese who found this character so fascinating that he wanted to watch him (laughs) so uh, he stayed there and his wife Connie Booth stayed there with him that was obviously uh, something he squirreled away yeah. And I guess that's if you're a comedy writer, that's the sort of thing you do <laughs> in general. Just see the world around you, see fascinating characters and, and, and go for that. As soon as you, you've sort of gone back in time a little bit there, I think we inevitably need to talk about Monty Python. Yeah. So, so that dates it interestingly. So that was 1967. This program was broadcast in 1975. So let's put a timeline on this then. When did Monty Python start? And, and you know, what's the, what's the timeline of John Cleese's career after that? Oh, actually, looking at my notes now, Monty Python was from 1969 to... In 1973, so it was a little bit later than I thought. Actually. Okay. Although, having said that, John Cleese dropped out after the third series, so he would have only been involved yeah. up to about 72, I guess. 
During that time, he was also a, a jobbing writer and, and doing other things. He had a company called Video Arts that made training videos, like in-house corporate videos, but with, you know, comedic kind of feel to it, which um, he seems to have made a lot of money from. I've seen lots of clips, the black and white sketches from the Frost Report in the 60s with John Cleese working with the two Ronnies, you know, the, the class system. That, oh, yeah, I know yeah. my place, those sketches. So that was before Monty Python's Flying Circus, right? Yes. Let's just do a whole bit of uh, John Cleese history if we if we're going to jump into that. He's from a very sort of typical, that kind of middle class, but they haven't quite got the money to match the aspirations Mm -hmm. sort of uh, vibe. A very typical Middle England kind of upbringing. And and that's something that's really been a huge inspiration point for him for such as Faulty Towers. Mm -hmm. He says a lot of the attitudes that have come through from Basil is from his upbringing in Milton Keynes. This is how people thought over there, you know. Yeah. Uh, For example, fawning over anyone who's slightly upper class or doctors. Doctors are treated like minor royalties. <laughs> so. It's the hyacinth bouquet thing, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Uh, pretension and upwardly mobile desperation to be accepted by the level above. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, but then also wanting to look down on people as well. Yes, that goes hand in hand, doesn't it? <laughs> It does with Hyacinth Bouquet, and it certainly does with Basil Fawlty. Yeah. So that comes a lot from his upbringing, obviously. So he went through a kind of prep school and, and was academically very bright and went to Cambridge. Pretty classic stuff of, of the time. Joined Cambridge Footlights. That's where he met Graham Chapman. Uh, that's where he knew Tim Brooke Taylor, Bill Oddy, you know, lots of others. Oh, do you know what I found out about the Cambridge Footlights while I was reading about this? Here's a little trivia for you. Who was the first fully-fledged female member of the Cambridge Footlights. Like the first the first name that comes to mind is Emma Thompson in the 80s. But is that is yeah. it before that? Does it predate her? It is before that. Although in, around that time, Jan Ravens was the first president, Jan the female Ravens, president yes. of okay. Cambridge Footlights. That was 1980. So this is 1964, first female member. And I, I believe Tim Brooke Taylor was the president at the time. He kind of pushed to have female members. Who, who is it? Go and tell us. Put us out of our misery. It is Jermaine Greer. Oh, right. Okay. Okay, that's interesting. Some interesting little side fact there for you. Uh, Yes, but uh, their Cambridge Review of that era, which would have been 64, I think, something like that, was one of the really big, major, successful ones. They ended up touring. They went to Australia. They went to New York. Mm Mm-hmm. Is while he was in America, he met Terry Gilliam. He met Connie Booth, who obviously he ended up marrying. Yeah. And even then, he wasn't particularly thinking of in terms of a career in comedy. It was just like, you know, you go to Cambridge, you study law, and then you go and be, be a lawyer or something. But he was approached by the BBC because of the success they'd had as, as a student review. Uh, uh, he'd approached by the BBC and like, hey, we want you as a writer. Uh, so anyway, that, that lair, he got a job at the BBC. And it, yes, because it was a, a salaried position and a proper pension and everything in the BBC, it was acceptable to his parents and all that as well. Right. That led to him working on things like The Frost Report, which, you know, he was writing and then occasionally performing. Yeah. Obviously, the classic sketch with the two Ronnies where he was the upper class gentleman because he was the tall one and all that sort of stuff. And I, I believe that's where he met Michael Palin, writing for The Frost Report. That led, sort of one thing or another, he was writing with Graham Chapman still at that point. Uh, one thing or another, that led to... Oh, look, I know this guy called Eric Idle. Let's work with him, <laughs> kind of yeah. thing. And suddenly you've got Monty Python. So Monty Python went on TV in 1969. Obviously, Monty Python has a major legacy and it is still remembered 50 years later and everything. But at the time, it was it was more of a cult hit. You know, it was, yeah. it was a hit. But, you know, your 50-year-old dad wasn't watching it. It was the young ones kind of equivalent. You know, it was the alternative comedy. The difference between that and a mainstream sitcom, such as Faulty Towers, was quite significant and something that hit John Cleese uh, after he he got that fame. But obviously he he got a bit sick of doing the Monty Python stuff. He left after the third season. He'd had enough and he was just sort of like, look, we've done we've done it now, haven't we? And it's just kind of it's yeah. all just the same crap now. Uh, so he he stepped away firstly. I do think that was largely influenced by the fact that he was doing his writing duties with Graham Chapman, who was an alcoholic at yeah. the time, yeah. and therefore was really having to carry some dead sure. weight there. Yeah. So in terms of timescales, then that's not what well, that's 1972. He would have left, and yes. the Python films came later, so after Faulty Towers. So we're not talking about those just yet. So what's he doing mm-hmm. in between Monty Python and getting Faulty Towers off the ground? 
Well, he and Graham Chapman wrote for Doctor in the House, and then he also uh, John Cleese alone wrote some episodes of Doctor at Large. A very specific one, which is of interest to us today, because he used uh, the hotelier that he'd met in Torquay as inspiration for a character in an episode he wrote. So this was in 1971. It was Series One, Episode 14 of Doctor at Large, uh, entitled "No Ill Feeling," and Barry Evans, uh, the actor playing the uh, the Doctor, yeah. there, stays at a hotel and. So the hotelier is this little kind of henpecked man who's very rude and his wife is a much bigger, brusque woman. It's interesting because you sent me a copy of this episode and I watched it last week. And I thought, well, this I can kind of see, you know, there's a line between this character and Basil Fawlty, but it's totally different. Mm. But this character in Doctor at Large is a lot more how you just described the real hotelier. Yes. Which was this henpecked guy. When, when we get to Basil Fawlty... You know, he's obviously henpecked, but he's got a lot more, uh, a lot more anger. He's got a lot more charisma, to be honest. Whereas mm. this little henpecked character in Doctor at Large was just a sort of very small but embittered character. Cereal? Uh, no, thanks, just... Kipper uh, or sausage? Would the kipper be quick? G- <laughs> oh, I beg your pardon? Would the kipper be quicker? Well, it'll be as quick as it can be. It can't be quicker than that, can it? <laughs> I mean, how quick can a kipper be? <laughs> I've got to cook the wretched thing. Yes. It, yeah, I mean, do you want it cold? No, no, I, I no. Look, I've got to make the beds by 11 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and I got that impression as well, obviously not particularly knowing who the real hoteliers were. I got the impression that this was the kind of the funny character that he'd seen who was just rude. And then when they come to make Faulty Towers, they go, OK, well, we're going to have to develop that slightly. And, yeah. it, and it takes on so much more of that Cleesian kind of eccentricity. Well, I it suppose. did make me realise how much of Cles there is in Basil Faulty. Because if you've got mm. this guy, this character in Doctor at Large, who's a, a prototype for Basil Faulty, I mean, what's the difference? The difference is that that character is played by you know a perfectly good jobbing actor whereas Basil Fawlty mm-hmm. has got all of John Cleese's energy in there and it completely transforms the character yeah exactly and uh, and then the other people around him have to change as well to, mm. to sort of fit in with that but there's also an element of just like okay well if we want to actually make a series out of this we need to change things up and, and make sure that it's got the legs for that yeah I guess you could see that as a kind of experiment. He'd obviously just seen this funny character, thought, oh, I can use that for a script, and then saw the potential for something further, something deeper, and that is where Faulty Towers came from. By this point, Cleese was married to Connie Booth. She had moved over to England with him, and they decided to write a sitcom based on this character. Mm-hmm. From what I understand, he went to the BBC and said, hey, I've got, I, I want to do something. I want to do a, like a classic sitcom. And they were like, OK, bring us a script. And if we like it, you know, we'll do it. Yeah. And that's what happened, which is obviously like, so that's what Monty Python gave him. That's what reputation gives him. He could walk into a, a meeting at the BBC and they yes. go, oh, yeah, OK, we're interested. So that's your foot in the door, even if Monty Python was only what we might call a cult hit at that point. Sure. Because despite the success of Monty Python, he wasn't exactly rolling in riches. Right. He started this company called Video Arts, which made sort of entertaining training films, which was just a way of making money. It was just churning out some work and earning a living. But it's not art. Now, that's interesting, Alan. I did know that. And I've actually been on a management training course way back when in the 90s. And suddenly a video with John Cleese turns up. And it's... (laughs) <laughs> it's not. I mean, it's played for laughs in that it's a funny video, but he's not taking the mickey. He's doing a training video. I know. I, yeah. I sort of knew that he had that as one of his little sidelines. So did he start doing that before Faulty Towers? Yeah, 72. Wow. They started that and did it all the way throughout. I think he officially sold it in the 80s, but for a huge amount of money. Mm. So they did very well out of it. But then he, he carried on working with them afterwards, but he just wasn't sort of quite directly involved. So that's what you will have seen something yeah. post that, I think. That turned into quite a nice little earner for him, I think. And that's not what you think of when you think, oh, comedy, great, writing, genius, artist, is it? No, that's, no, that's absolutely. A, that's but, a job. Not, you know, there's, not a, there's a sort of running joke about John Cleese about, you know, his divorce is costing him a lot of money and he needs to pay <laughs> the bills. Yeah. This, he's still on his first marriage, so you can't use that as an excuse. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't worried about that at that point. <laughs> uh, that'll come later. But yeah, so he's doing that and obviously through that worked with a lot of actors, most of whom appeared in Faulty Towers and one mm. of whom was Andrew Sachs. Right. He'd done a couple of things with video arts. Uh, so we'll get to that later. 
Well, that's interesting. I mean, we will we will indeed get to the supporting cast later, mm. but that's a really interesting and very different route into sitcom is having worked on <laughs> training videos with the writer. I don't think we've seen that before. <laughs> so we're still in the seventies, and like I said, it, obviously Clee's reputation speaks for something because they they were happy to see a script, they liked it. Let's do a pilot, but. Having said that, this was a really low-budget sitcom. They did not get a lot of money for it, and that does show in some aspects. Oh, there was a very, there was some very wobbly sets, aren't there? There was a couple of times yeah. watching some of the episodes where, almost as a as a consequence of Basil Fawlty's frenetic energy, he's, he's literally bouncing off the walls and they're shaking and shuddering. <laughs> you could see that. You could see there was no expense spent on some of those sets. <laughs> yeah, and that's I've heard I've heard that from sort of many sources that it was very low budget. And I actually got some numbers somewhere. The budget for the first episode was twenty thousand pounds okay presumably that is as a first episode as a pilot which means they have to build the set yeah if you're making one episode or six you still have to build one set twenty thousand pounds uh i don't know what's that worth uh, in in well this, in uh, it's funny you should place. ask because i've been doing some calculations you warned me about this basically <laughs> the, the multiplier is about four and a half so in 1975 Twenty thousand pounds would be about ninety thousand pounds in today's money. Apparently, John Cleese was paid for the first series for everything, writing and uh, acting, was paid six thousand pounds. Okay, which certainly the way he tells it is such a small amount that it was ridiculous. Not because obviously for a six week filming block, mm. pretty good, but they had to write the scripts, him and Connie Booth, sure. and they were spending six weeks on each script. You know, it was yeah. a, a huge task because they were perfectionists. They want to it. take a leaf out of Richard Herring's book. Do it in two days. <laughs> Just show them out. <laughs> uh, here's an interesting thing. When they came to the second series in 1979, it got a big pay raise of £9,000 because they knew they had a hit. Okay. So he got, he got 9000 for that one. But what I found interesting in terms of numbers was that Andrew Sachs for the second series, and like I say, they all got paid more, yeah. he got paid £350. Per episode? No. In total? Yeah. Bloody hell. So the maths on that is, <laughs> hang on, £1,600. Yeah, for six weeks' work, I guess, if you're thinking it just in terms of the filming block. You're an actor, probably not in as quite as large a supporting role as Andrew Sachs. Would that be a good pay for, for today for, you know, six weeks' work? Not good pay for something at that level. I mean, equity minimum is, well, it depends what it is, but it's sort of ranging about 350 to 450 a week. Okay. so yeah, uh, As an absolute way. minimum. But for TV work, it's probably more than that. I don't know off the top of my head. So what are we saying here? We're saying that they weren't spending a lot of money. Even the second series, they didn't have a lot of money to spend. Well, that's it's part of the culture of specifically the BBC. Mm. This is what you get paid. Look, if we're doing a show, this is how much it pays. Yeah. This is how much we pay actors. You take it or leave it, really. And that is how kind of commercial television got a foothold and were able to like woo people like your Morecambe and Wise and Benny Hill and all that sort of thing mm -hmm. because they could offer more money as long as they could sell the adverts. But the BBC offers something else and, and it's something we'll see in these episodes. Faulty Towers had a half hour slot but they would overwrite it completely and then they would film it and they might cut it down and it come into 33 minutes mm. and the BBC were that. It's okay. 33 minutes if that's what works. Stick an extra few minutes on. That's not a problem. Yeah, you can't do that on ITV. Sure. You couldn't do it on the BBC now, but you know back then. <laughs> but that was it, really. He was jobbing uh, writer largely. He did do a lot of adverts. He says that the the only reason he could do Faulty Towers for such little money was because he just did loads of adverts, mm -hmm. and that paid for everything. But you know, ultimately, they got the series commissioned. They filmed the first episode in late 1974. And obviously that went to series. And so they all got shown mm -hmm. in sort of September, I think it was, 76, but filmed earlier that year. So shall we... Well, before we go on to our episode, how was the first series received then? Was it, you know, we were talking about Monty Python being a bit of a cult hit and not necessarily a huge smash. Where did Faulty Towers sit? Was it a peak time mainstream sitcom or was it, uh, again, a little bit of a cult classic? Yeah, it went out, it went out on BBC Two. So straight uh, away, you know, right. that tells you something. Uh, went out 9pm slot on a Friday night, and it got viewers, that very first episode got viewers of 1.9 million. But that's why they're not spending much money on it, I guess, because they've got it slated as a BBC Two sitcom. Exactly, yeah. And 1.9 million, from what I understand, is respectable for that time mm -hmm. slot, but nothing groundbreaking. The, the reviews that came in were sort of tepid, mm. sort of just non-committal, really. 
But as it went along, it built and people started to find it. And, and it ended up with 3.3 um, million viewers yeah. by episode six. So that's growth. I mean, that's great. But it's interesting, isn't it, that we've looked at some really mainstream sitcoms in the last series. And if you look back through British sitcom history, at the, the, the sitcoms that have really changed the landscape, things like Faulty Towers, things like The Young Ones, things like The Office, hmm. none of those are mainstream successes. They're sort of BBC Two type shows. And I guess the nature yeah. of these things as we look back is that for every Faulty Towers or Young Ones, there's going to be 10 or 12 forgotten sitcoms that were on in that slot that just didn't take off and didn't change the world but it's good that we have the bbc taking those risks and putting those shows on even if they're not spending a lot of money on it that's probably good because they need to take those risks yeah you can't do new things and be on the edges and be mainstream it's just mm. not this <laughs> is not possible it doesn't yeah. make any sense until you become the mainstream of course yeah, that's kind of the way with Faulty Towers. People had never quite seen anything like this before, like an actual full-on farce on TV. Mm. Not just a bit of physical comedy, but a full-on scripted f farce. That's what it is. I mean, we'll, uh, get into, we'll get into the episode in a second, but that's absolutely what it is. It's a frenetic farce. Mm. Should we tell our listeners which episode we're going to talk about? Yeah. We've obviously uh, famously only 12 episodes of Faulty Towers, and we've actually settled on the final one, Season 2, Episode 6, which is Basil the Rat. Mm -hmm. Viewers will remember the one with uh, where Manuel has a filigree hamster. Mm -hmm. Now, it is the final episode, but it's not a final episode, is it? There are no arcs closed or anything like that. I, and I wonder, before we get into the detail of it, did they know this was the final episode? Obviously, Faulty Towers famously stopped after two series. Was that always the plan, or was that something that just, you know, it didn't get recommissioned? Uh, it wasn't planned as such. From what I understand, you know, they did the first series... And it was fairly experimental. It was kind of like, okay, let's throw this out there, see how it goes. Then it was a huge success, and it took them a few years to get the next one up and running. So mm. by the time they were making the second series, it was a huge pressure on them to do it well, to get it right. Yeah. It was a real kind of like, look, everyone's remembered Faulty Towers as an absolute classic, even though it's probably not as good as they think it is. There were four and years, right? Four years between one and two. You look back now and you just think late 70s is all the same. But in the, at the time, that would have been a hell of a delay between series one and two. Mm. Yeah, I'll get into why that was in a bit. But I think John Cleese particularly felt the immense pressure of delivering that second series. And they pulled it off. It's as good as, if not better than the first series. After that, I think there was no inclination to try and do it again. Okay. I think it's a very stressful and difficult from, thing to do. From who? They, from Cleese and Booth? Yes, from the writers. Yeah, 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 definitely. I think if the circumstances maybe had just been slightly different or something had just dropped the right way, maybe it would have happened. Maybe if, they, if there was a, a different culture at that particular time to make a film, that would have been a possibility. Mm. But ultimately, there wasn't enough inspiration or motivation to do it. And it was one of those things where it's like, we're only going to mess this up. So let's just leave it as it is. It's fine. Uh, one of the reasons we chose Basil the Rat, Series 2, Episode 6, is because it is a really good example of what they do. Mm. It's got all the main characters in it. It's a really nice ensemble piece that, that shows off everyone, including the Major, having some really nice moments. Yeah, And it's exactly what you described about that farce. It all builds up to that visual punchline at the end with the rat looking out of the biscuit tin. Yeah. But we, we spend half an hour moving those chess pieces around and agitating everything until you get to that moment. It's uh, We've discussed before, you know, I'm not a huge fan of, of farcical elements and or indeed a physical comedy. I like the lyricism. I like the clever dialogue. Yeah. But having said all of that, this is incredibly well executed farce. Yeah, I think let me just you set disagree my stall out here. Because... <laughs> Sounds like you don't agree with me. Well, I want to, let's put this out here straight away. Because I don't find farce particularly funny. And my instinct with Faulty Towers was that I don't like it. I watched it through and it's like, I don't, I don't find it funny. I, I, I don't like this show. I don't think it's very good. I don't think it's as good as... Well, I don't know why it's so well remembered. What's going on? But in through doing this, doing all the research, listening to a lot of interviews and all that sort of thing, I have gained a much greater appreciation for the craft that has gone into this, yeah. if not the comedy that has come out of it, because I still don't find it especially funny. And I particularly don't find the funny bits funny, if you know what I mean. The thing, the, the bits I really like are usually little throwaway lines, yes. little bits of wordplay yeah. that do get a laugh. You know, obviously they're supposed to be funny. 
But I would love to see a, a really well dialogue driven sitcom written by John Cleese and Connie Booth because it yeah. sounds sounds like it would be really good. But I do have to acknowledge that a lot of this stuff is done well. Mm. However, I think it's done well under the circumstances. And I think this is a fundamental flaw with Faulty Towers. Farce, in these circumstances, really, really struggles to work. TV farce. I think farce is, by its very nature, a theatrical event. Yeah. I think you can do it in film with slick editing and be able to film whatever you want. And I think in TV, particularly this period of TV, which is essentially as live recording, you know, and with the very yeah. limited sets and everything, it's caught between two things here. It can't have that live nature to it where things can go wrong and you can kind of laugh it off and, and you have that forgiving nature mm. of live performance. And also, you haven't got the rehearsal period of a theatrical performance. You haven't got the repeated eight days a week yeah. performance schedule, which will get you absolutely drummed into perfect physical comedy. And then you haven't got the grace of what you get with film of being able to edit it together and, and mm. creating your timing and, and everything there. I think it falls between the two stools and as such really, really suffers. And they've done everything they possibly can to make it work. And it still doesn't work for me. Okay. Obviously it works for loads of other people. So. Well, you know, I don't think I'm a million miles away from you there. I guess my point is that I think it's well executed farce, but I suppose mm. I'm comparing it to other television farce. And I'm also acknowledging that it's not really my, it's not really my favorite thing, but I agree with you in, in yeah. what you said about they're doing that thing well. Uh, and I, I'll stand by that. I think that as farce goes and as physical comedy goes, this is probably, I won't say as good as it gets, but, you know, it's, it's up there. It's, it's as good as it gets on television. I mean, I think I might say it's as good as it gets. I just think this is as good as it gets. <laughs> I see. Yeah. So stop doing it then. <laughs> yes. Okay. So let's jump into the episode with let's. that sort of in mind. Go on then. Talk us through the episode and set it all up for us. And we'll go through and perhaps we'll branch off and talk about the characters as we get to them. Yeah. Well, of course, we start with, as most of the episodes do, a, an exterior setup shot of the, the hotel itself and a hilarious anagram on the sign. Yeah. Um, you know, a, a cheeky paperboy has rearranged the letters. In this case, it re reads farty towels, which is fine. A little sight gag. See, for see each that really? The, the pedant in me. I can't cope with the fact that it's not a perfect anagram. <laughs> <laughs> I believe the only perfect anagram they have is flowery twats. <laughs> I mean, genuinely, that annoys me at the start of every single episode. I have to sort of pause the video and go, well, hang on, there's a W missing there. Well, that's not right, is it? That's not right. Well, the thing, the, you can just take one of the letters off and throw I may be, it on the I may be overthinking it's it. It's, it's possible. <laughs> we have uh, our theme music. <laughs> Uh, apparently, um, John Howard Davis, who, who produced and directed the first series, he wanted them to play it badly, like to be kind of slightly atonal, and, and that would be kind of lend to the humour, but they they just couldn't bring themselves to do it badly. <laughs> like they're too, mm. too professional. But yes, we have we have your classic music, and we, we begin this episode with a, a little um, bit of exterior video shooting. Uh, all the film stuff, uh, exterior shots, were shot a few weeks before they ever got into studio. Okay. So obviously it all had to be planned out in advance, particularly when you've got a guest star ap appearing in there. Yeah. You know, you need to cast them weeks ahead and everything. But I think for the large part, they slip in really seamlessly. I think they mm -hmm. use them very sparingly. We're mostly s nicely in that hotel. And I, I like that. That's classic sitcom for me. We watched this episode, and I also watched this week another three or four episodes. Obviously, I've seen them all before, but I did notice a couple of times where we had exterior shots, and it did feel a little bit edited. There's the mm. famous uh, scene of uh, Basil thrashing his car, uh, which is obviously yeah. a classic sitcom scene. But again, it, it sort of feels forced in. It sort of feels crowbarred into what is a perfect sitcom in a perfect setting. Yeah, I think it works fine uh, for that, but... Yeah, you, you don't have that energy of the, the live performance, I think. Yeah. And certainly him thrashing the car, it's the only real proper bit of here's a big yeah. comedy set piece. All yeah. the rest of it is just to tell the story, just to join things together. Mm. So yeah, our episode begins uh, with them arriving. Uh, Basil goes into the kitchen, he finds a strange man just poking around the fridge and in his usual sort of sarcastic, dismissive manner, just thinks he's a customer who's doesn't know his place. Uh, shall I get you the wine list? 
Mr. Forty. Mr. Oh, please uh, call me waiter. Look, I'll go and get a chair, and then you can really tuck in. There's some stuff in the bin you might like. You know, potato peelings, cold rice pudding, that sort of thing. Not exactly haute cuisine, but it'll certainly help to fill you up. So this guy turns out to be the health inspector. But yeah, Basil just thinks, who's this guy in the kitchen? But instead of saying, like any other guy, oh, what's going on here? Can I help? He goes in hard, he goes in aggressive, he goes in sarcastic. Right from the off. He does indeed, yeah. And so, yeah, this is obviously, it transpires, this is the health inspector, played by John Quamby, and he lists off a retinue of problems with their kitchen that they have to fix within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. What I quite like about this, first of all, John Quamby throughout this whole episode he is the straightest of straight men uh, that we have in this entire show. Yeah. Because even, you know, there's all sorts of guest uh, characters that come through. Bernard Cribbins is a good example. But obviously, he's a very comedic actor. Even when they're playing the straight man, they're not trying to do gags. They're still there setting things up. Whereas with this guy, mm. it really feels like... It feels very real, I suppose, as yeah. a <laughs> health yeah. inspector. And he's very straight down the line. And I kind of like that. It yeah. sort of gives the whole thing a strange tone to it because I think it is a little bit unusual. But this gives us a, this first scene gives us an insight into Basil's character. As I say, he comes in hard, aggressive, sarcastic, condescending. And then when the guy reveals who he is, he's his health inspector, Basil just capitulates. In the face of any sort of authority figure... He's obsequious and, oh, yes, we'll do that. And, of course, we'll sort that out and very sorry. And, you know, he's, he's almost literally bowing and scraping sometimes. Yeah. So any kind of authority figure in the first episode, we have the uh, Lord Marbury, who turns out to be a fake lord. Mm -hmm. But, you know, his, his obsequiousness in front of any yeah. sort of authority figure is... Um, He's alarming. Something he does a lot. For example, in the you know the hotel inspector, where he thinks a particular person is an inspe uh, hotel inspector, so mm. he's bowing and scraping to them. When he finds out he's not, he couldn't care less about them, and in fact, he's angry that they've pretended to be yes. a hotel inspector, even yeah. though they didn't know they were doing that. And then immediately switches his attention to someone else. I do find it a little bit inconsistent, I guess. Who he chooses to be deferential to or to try and please does kind of come and go it is obviously anyone who's kind of a bit upper class he's yes being deferential to them but then sometimes there's a very difficult customer mm -hmm. who he's just very rude to mrs richardson is a good example in communication problems where yeah. he is ultimately trying to hack her down at every level because she's very rude and he's just doing everything he can to keep her happy as a customer but also just knock her down at any any point but then we've got a customer the american customer played by bruce bauer yeah in waldorf salad and he's very deferential to him and desperately trying to make him happy which i think is just because he's uh, scared of him <laughs> rather rather than he's he's bowing That's and scraping a good to point him. yeah i just i find basil a little bit inconsistent with all that sort of thing and is, is the fact how he behaves towards Sybil sometimes? And is it just simply that he's a bully? Is that all it is? So when he comes into contact with someone who's got more power or is a, is a bigger bully, then he just backs down. There is some truth to that, I guess. But even then, he'll like he'll go up against a cocky Cockney mm. tradesman. You know, he will like he won't let them get yes. the better of him, and he'll go really out of his way to try and catch them doing something and all that. It never quite holds together for me, and it's just one of the sort of major okay. problems so I we've have. We've got this element of him being a, a bully. We've also got that class status thing where he wants to be something more. So where it's Lord Marbury, he he wants to be on a level and have that conversation yeah. with him. And when it's um, O'Reilly, the builder, he looks down on him. He knows his place. He looks down on him, and so he'll talk to him like, like dirt, you know? Yeah. So in, in the episode, the, the staff have to quickly uh, snap together and, and get everything done. We see Sybil here, actually. This is another interesting one, just speaking of kind of inconsistency of character. Mm. Sybil, uh, I have a similar problem with because, as we see here, backs to the wall, we've got to sort all this out. She snaps into work mode. She's mm -hmm. getting everything done. She's rallying everyone. But so often we see her just slacking off, talking on the phone, not really working, just oh, nagging no. Basil. And... I don't quite know what Sybil is supposed to be either. Mm -hmm. Is she the one holding everything together or is she a thorn in Basil's side? I mean, she could be both in that sense. Sure. I agree with you. I, I agree with you. When you look at Sybil, exactly that. So sometimes she is the, the rock, the glue holding the hotel together while Basil freaks out and, and flails around. But yes, she absolutely is a thorn in his side. 
And, you know, he wants to do things to make the hotel better and she just dismisses it. Now, maybe she's being mm. sensible and more pragmatic. The gourmet night, for example. Yes. He's wasting money on advertising, this sort of thing. But, but actually, she's stifling him. He wants to be more and she, she won't let him try things. I've got this theory I've been working on and I want to talk it through with you. That there's a no real similarity between Basil and Sybil Fawlty and Harold and Albert Steptoe. <laughs> My theory okay. is this. Basil is Harold and Sybil is Albert. The hotel yeah. is there, is the yard. It's a cage where Basil's trapped and he wants to better himself, but ultimately he can't escape. No matter what he does, he's stuck in this hotel with these awful people. The bell rings again and he's got to come back to that counter and face these idiots. It's like this sort of, just this Sisyphus just rolling the rock up the, yes. up, the, up the slope. And Sybil is there in that Albert role, holding him back. Every time he wants to do something and better himself, she won't let him. She undermines him, she undercuts him. Yes, okay, sometimes he needs that, but he's reaching for the stars and she's rooting him to the ground. I see what you're saying there, but I think there's a very crucial difference here in the... So Harold wants to better himself because he knows he's better than what he's got. He knows he's, he has so much more potential. Mm -hmm. Basil wants to better himself because... Basil thinks he does have all that potential. Yeah, but he hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so there's our difference. <laughs> and th th this is a crucial difference, though, because th this is another major problem I have with it. And not a problem as such, it's deliberate. Basil is entirely unlikable. He's a really unpleasant person. Mm -hmm. And that is a crucial difference to, say, a Harold Steptoe, to, say, a Victor Meldrew, who, when we talked about One Foot in the Grave, we talked about how Victor Meldrew, even though he's a very cranky kind of, uh, and does some odd things, we're always kind of on his side. We're always yeah. sort of, like, rooting for him. I don't have that with Basil. Yeah. They've deliberately made him extremely unlikable. Yes, I think the difference here with my uh, analogy is that in Steptoe and Son, you're rooting for Harold to get away, and Albert's the bitter old man holding him back. Whereas mm. in Faulty Towers, you're not rooting for Basil. And actually, in a lot of the cases, Sybil's right. <laughs> Sybil's right to hold yeah. him back. Yeah. And like I say, Basil is extremely rude to people and unprofessional as a hotelier. But then... Sybil is quite unprofessional at times as well. Like she okay. will, she stays on the phone talking, talking to her friend rather than s serving customers. She said at one point, um, a line I wrote down was, oh gosh, we haven't had time to scrape the mold off the cheddar, which is, which is the sort of thing you would expect Basil to say. Yeah. Another example of that is in The Kipper and the Corpse where they have to deal with a dead body. Yeah. We have to set up that Basil, later on when he finds the dead body, is going to think that they have accidentally killed him with these off-kippers. Yeah. And so, in the first scene, he's got this kippers going, have you seen the date on these? These are off. And everyone's going, no, no, they're fine. Like He's like, no, no, we shouldn't be serving these people. And the chef's going, no, no, it's, it's fine, they're fine. That's not Basil. Basil is, oh, just give him any old crap, who cares? Mm -hmm. uh, but we have to have that, because later on he's got to think, oh my god, we've killed him. Yes. But I think you could easily write that as Sybil going, we shouldn't serve those kippers, get rid of them, walks away, and then Basil goes to the chef, oh, look, don't worry about it, just get those kippers served, will you? Yeah. And you, you achieve the same thing, and then later on when he finds out it's the kippers, he's worried because it's his fault, not their fault, it's his fault. So that, that maintains the integrity of the characters a bit better, yeah. It's those small things that just throw the consistency off for me. The whole script, the whole thing is very tightly scripted. And I think they've obviously put a lot of time and effort into making these things work. And maybe just a few things slip through. So, you know, not to judge too harshly. But they're, they're really concerned with the structure and making sure that the things are seeded in. And so they've seeded in that kipper thing. But I think they've just done it the wrong way there. Yeah. Anyway, so to come back to our episode, also food related, we have all these problems and... We see that the, uh, our chef is not particularly concerned with uh, with the, the cleanliness of the kitchen. He seems to think that's a sign of a good working kitchen that yep. is dirty, uh, which I, I like that. I think that's probably quite realistic <laughs> of a chef. Terry, the chef, is brought in in the second series as a regular character. Mm -hmm. So they've decided they this hotel doesn't have enough staff. Yep. Played by Brian Hall. Mm -hmm. The problem here is that he doesn't add anything. The character doesn't bring anything. The one thing he does is that he's the straight man. He's the he's the kind of sane voice in this slightly odd world. Mm. But that's what Polly's function is. So they've brought him in as a practical character because, like, hey, you know, we should have a chef. But then he doesn't really. Well, I do noticed anything. having watched this through again with a bit more of an analytical eye that in the second series Polly's character changes, and perhaps you've hit why. So in the first series, she's the normal character in this crazy world. Mm. And then, yeah, in the second series, she becomes sucked into that crazy world. And, and Terry, the chef, holds that 
normal role, if you like. Yeah, I think you're right. I think Polly never quite goes to the extremes of Basil, but there is some examples. And in fact, there's a really good example in this episode where she's trying to sell one of her pictures to a customer and she's doing a really hard sell. Mm-hmm. And then when he's like, no, 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 thanks, she sort of calls him a name as he sort of <laughs> walks out of the hotel. And then straight after that, Manuel does something stupid and she grabs him and calls him a Dago Dodo. And it's like, that's Basil. That, that's yes. like a Basil script that they accidentally put yeah. Polly's name on top of. No, I'm sorry. I, I really don't. Oh, just a fiver. You can have it on approval. Uh, sorry. It's for my sister's eye operation. <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> Polly! Oh, what? He gone! What? He gone, he escaped! But how did he get out of the cage? I leave door open so he can exercise in shed. Oh, you <laughs> dig out dodo! <laughs> that, again, it just seems totally out of character. And I don't believe, because I think if you were going to do this, you'd do it more consistently. I don't believe that the idea is they're rubbing off on her and she's starting to lose sense of reality. <laughs> and she's oh, just no, becoming no, I'm not like assigning that. that level of thought to it. I don't think it's deliberate. I just mean that, as you said, we've got the four main characters in the first series. And she's at the sensible end. And by bringing in Terry at that sensible end, she therefore slides down the scale a little bit. Yeah. And yeah, but you're right. Particularly in the first series, that is Polly's function. She is the sane one. So when all this craziness is going around her, she will just sort of pop in and make sense of it. But also she's a bit of a confidant for Basil. Because Basil has to keep everything secret from Sybil. Mm-hmm. But she can kind of be in on the plots somewhat. Yeah. Uh, even if it's quite reluctantly sometimes. And I think that actually serves a function, because when I first watched this on my first pass, I was like, Polly is completely pointless. You could just take her out completely. And that's not true. You do need her there, but I wish they'd just put more character into it. I I think you can have that straight man, but do it with a bit more personality and character. We never really find out much about her. I agree. I mean, we've talked about John Cleese. Shall we branch off and talk a little bit about Connie Booth now because yeah my yeah I agree with you I, I think Polly is kind of a, 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 a cipher she's not there's not a lot there but I also feel the same way about Connie Booth I know that she was in Monty Python I've seen her in sketches of that but other than that I don't know like what else has she been in I, I don't really know her yeah not much really she was just sort of a jobbing actor slash waitress um, in New York mm-hmm. she was just trying to scrape by met John Cleese and obviously they ended up getting married he obviously really likes what she does, put her in some Monty Python stuff. And then so when they wrote this, they, you know, wrote a part for themselves. And this, pretty much, apart from the Monty Python stuff, was the first TV acting, certainly as a sort of major role like that. Yeah. And so I think she was a bit nervous about it. And they deliberately made the character fairly small because of that. Well, like she well, didn't look, want too much pressure. I don't want to be too rude about it, but she's not very good. She's not a very good actor. Yeah, I know what you mean. I don't think she's bad, particularly, but yeah, she's not doing anything particularly special in a series that is pretty extraordinarily well cast throughout. Mm. Mm. She certainly doesn't shine, but I think she does it fine. And, you know, there's obviously some chemistry there that Mm. means they can all work together. It's it's probably best to tell the story of Cleese and Booth's marriage as well Mm. at this point, because obviously they were married. Even by the time they were doing... Faulty Tower Series 1, there was a bit of turmoil in the relationship, I guess. And by the time they came to Series 2, they'd divorced. Oh, really? Oh, gosh, I so didn't know they... that. I knew they're not still together. I knew it was he, she was yeah. his first ex-wife, but um, I didn't. Really, I thought that came after Faulty Tower. No, it was all happening at that time, and they'd split up, they lived separately for a while, and then it kind of became like, yeah, look, we're definitely not going to get together here, let's get divorced. But obviously stayed close. They do, ha- they do have a daughter together, so they've got that connection. They were sort of separated and living in the same house for a while, which I guess if you've got a nice big house, that's fine. Yeah. But yeah, and they stay close, and as far as I understand, still are today. Certainly, judging by the interviews and, and kind of DVD commentaries and things that I've heard, which were, you know, that's probably 15 years old now anyway. <laughs> but yeah, John Cleese has a great affection for her in his commentaries. So fine, that meant they could work together. But certainly that may have played a part in why it took a few years to get the second series together. Well, yeah, that that's, that makes a lot of sense. And and after, she she was a jobbing actor, really. Obviously, the, the notoriety that Faulty Towers brought, uh, the greater fame, meant she got a few more roles and things. But not much came of it. She was never a really sort of a, a lead star or anything. And just fell out of love with the industry, I think. Just was ready to move on. Officially quit acting in the 90s and retrained as a psychotherapist and 
and did that. Well, that's making me think of Pamela Stevenson from Not the Nine O'Clock News. Yeah, she thought, did the same thing, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. But she she does that. I don't know if she still does it. She, she's of an age now where she might be retired, but um, she certainly did that for a long time. And she didn't really do any even interviews for Faulty Towers and stuff uh, until a long time after. She was just sort of like, that was a different time in my life. I'm separating it. I'm a therapist now. I don't need to go on telly and talk about Faulty Towers. I think that's fair enough. She, she moved on. But yeah, she never really did a lot of acting and, and never really wrote anything else. And I think perhaps in the early years particularly, there was an easy uh, way to go, oh, John Cleese wrote that. It's John Cleese's mm-hmm. Faulty Towers. You know, he's central performance. But So he's made a, a great effort to go. No, she really was a big part of the writing of this. But when if, if you go on and never write anything else, <laughs> as opposed to, you know, sure. being a, a, a famed comedy writer, it's, it's going to go that way, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's about all we've got time for this week. Quite a journey so far. But do come back next time because we will continue to look at our episode, Basil the Rat. And also we will look at Prunella Scales and Andrew Sachs and see how they came to fit into this show. We hope you've enjoyed listening. And while you're waiting for the next installment, do please uh, follow us on the social medias. We are on Instagram and Twitter at BritcomPod. And if you enjoy our podcast in general, please do rate and review us on iTunes. It helps to raise our profile and we get more listeners, which is always good. Thank you very much for listening and see you next time. 